Okay, Madeira USA has a, a business blog, and it's called MadeiraMatters.net. Uh, we have a fictional character named Professor T.H. Reed um, who posts blogs, and in May of 2014, our professor posted a blog that he titled Six Billion Reasons Why You Need to Master Embroidering on Performance Wear. Two years later, the New York Times coined the term athleisure as an apparel category that includes clothing, footwear, and accessories that are suitable for work, workouts, and leisure activities. It puts the size of the athleisure market in the U.S. at $97 billion annually. So in two years' time, you see that kind of growth spurt for performance wear um, apparel. Adding a little bit more perspective, the trade association Cotton, Inc. points to the convergence of several consumer and retail trends within the activewear market. They say that more than 9 out of 10, or 92% consumers, say they wear athletic wear, or performance wear as we refer to it, for activities other than exercise. With this trend showing absolutely no signs of slowing, the importance of mastering embroidering on these performance fabrics is really paramount to your business, and that's why we're taking a, an in-depth look at it today. So with lots and lots of information to cover, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Rich, if you'd please begin on designs and digitizing. Sure. Well, with embroidering on this uh, performance wear, of course, a lot of you have already discovered it. It's a very stretchy material, and it poses a real challenge for us embroiderers. Um, what I'm going to discuss in the digitizing end of this is um, where to start and stop certain fill areas. Um, uh, in other words, how to how to create the design center uh, embroidering from the center uh, out and from the bottom up. We're going to talk about stitch densities, um, how that affects the performance wear. Uh, the proper use of underlay, what type of underlay works best, um, and also uh, what are the push and pull uh, um, aspects of this particular material. Um, as you know, push and pull has to do with distortions that occur uh, in the embroidery process. Uh, and uh, basically, what to avoid uh, when you're embroidering on this type of material. Um, in particular, obviously, high stitch count designs um, and also other type of um, techniques that sometimes we can get away with it with other types of material but are really bad for this kind of material. Uh, so the whole goal, goal is to give you an idea, at least in the digitizing end of it, um, as well as some other aspects, uh, what are the formulas or what are the do's and don'ts uh, to create uh, the best success when you're embroidering on this material. Okay, here um, we've got some examples. I, I sent these um, designs are basically really simple, two little circles. Um, on the left, uh, were the were done incorrectly, and I deliberately did some um, things to this to to uh, these designs to create this effect. And you can see from the pictures here, you've got this kind of potato chip, uh, curly, um, distorted effect, and that's that's probably the the one thing that is most frustrating with embroidering on this material is that you get a nice design and you, you get an expensive uh, polo shirt uh, with this performance wear and you embroider it and you pop it out of the hoop and it looks like this and it's really embarrassing it's it's really hard to um, give that to your customer and expect them to want to come back for more <laughs> so um, basically on the left here what I did was um, I uh, embroidered with different, I, I set the, the design up with different stitch direction, different underlay, and different densities, and then I also overstretched the garment when I um, hooped it. And we'll talk about it hooping later, but for right now, let's co concentrate on the digitizing aspect. Uh, what I like to do is I like to keep the, um, the fill stitch direction uh, as horizontal as possible. Not completely horizontal, I like about a 15 degree a tilt to the uh, stitch direction. And the other thing I try to do is I keep the densities as down as I, as, as low as I can and I keep the stitch length um, up to four millimeters or even higher if I can get away with it because longer stitch length puts less stress on this material. And then finally what I like to do is um, I like to make sure that the when you sew different elements in a, de in a design you don't trap the material in other words, you be careful where you, how you start and stop 
certain elements of the design so that you don't um, uh, trap or bubble up the material and cause distortion. Um, I think if we showed the next slide here, we'll show you a simulation of these of this design, the circles. Um, in this particular one, this is the one that I uh, purposely did incorrectly. And what I did was, um, first of all, it's only got a single pass underlay that you can see from this uh, simulation. And the single pass um, uh, does minimal amount of um, stabilizing. And then finally, when it finally starts to sew, as you can see here, the first circle sews, starts from the right, comes in halfway to it, and then actually goes back to the center again. And then the, the next final circle um, sews from the left to the right. So if you can imagine what's going on with this material is, it's being pushed all to the center and it's causing massive distortion. And then finally, like I mentioned, I deliberately um, overstretched the material when I hooped it. And of course, then when it's all said and done, you pop it out of the hoop, it turns into a big mess. And this is what you want to try to avoid. So uh, the correct way now, on the next slide, uh, this is the same circles and everything, but I changed the underlay to start with. The underlay um, is done in what's, what's called a crosshatch or some uh, embroidery software, it's called lattice. But it's basically, as you can see, it's two passes of underlay. And one is at a 45 degree angle to the top stitch direction. And then the second pass is at 135 degrees to the top fill stitch direction. But the other crucial thing I did was I started the design, that these elements, at the bottom of the circle. See how it's sewing from the bottom up on both cases. And neither one ends or finishes where it traps the material. Um, the other thing I did was I increased the stitch length some. And then because of the crosshatch underlay, I was able to lighten the densities so that we don't distort or, or stress the material in any way. Um, one of the things that I think people forget about in, in uh, embroidery is that really underlay is not unnecessary uh, stitches. They're essential stitches. And what they do is first they stabilize the material, which is crucial for this type of uh, performance wear. But also it provides a loft um, for aiding in coverage. And so in other words, by having this type of underlay, I can actually have lighter top stitch density and still get great coverage. Whereas I think a lot of people tend to, when they have a problem with coverage, like if the shirt's showing through, they just bump up the top stitch density and they forget about the underlay. And the underlay really is, is, uh, plays a big factor in, in aiding in uh, coverage. And so it's very important to, to do both uh, in order to gain what you need. Uh, Anyway, you can see how this thing sews uh, bottom up. There's no trapping of it. Um, comes out nice and flat, as you could see in the pictures before this. But, uh, hey, Rich, it's Nancy. I have a question for you. So one might think that it might balance itself out by adding underlay and reducing the um, top stitch, but that's not true, right? Well, I think I like to do both. I like to add underlay, um, and then that way I don't have to put so much top stitch a density in. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention, and I, I'm glad that you uh, piped in, but um, there's what we're trying to do by doing this uh, uh, horizontal, or as I call it, 15 degree stitch angle on the uh, fill stitch area, is we're trying to avoid um, stressing the material and, and what's called uh, the bias of the material. Now the bias, and you can explain this better than I can, but the bias is basically the most stretchiest part of the material. So if you take a shirt, for example, before you even embroider it, and you pull on it side to side, top to bottom, and then also diagonally at a 45, you'll notice that the diagonal pull is where you get the most stretch. And so that in particular is crucial to avoid uh, a stitch direction in your main fill areas that fall in that 45 degree angle. 
Uh, Nancy, you wanted to discuss uh, more of what the bias is about, or did I do a fair job of it? I think you did a really good job um, on that, Rich. I think people might be able to relate to it a little more if you think of a woven fabric more so, because you don't you get very little stretch when you're stretching um, side to side and from top to bottom. But then when you do go to pull on those angles, the 45 degree angles, you get you get a stretch in a fabric that you don't think you would normally get a stretch from. Um, so I think it's a little easier to relate it to a web lawn, I'm sorry, a woven fabric, uh, but it also applies to the knit fabrics as well. So essentially, those are the weaker points. Um, so by changing the angle of your fill, um, you're putting less stress, like Rich said. Is yeah, it, uh, and that's what we're, again, what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to really um, not overstress this material or, or let's say minimize the amount of it and remember here we are we're putting a whole bunch of stitches some of these designs can, can get up to pretty uh, high stitch count even for left chest but you're adding a bunch of, of thread on this already stretchy thin material and so what we got to do is kind of sneak up on it and, and do it in such a way that uh, we can get away with it and still uh, have a good quality look and one that even after washing looks good Rich, just a, a quick question that came in on these circle designs. What fill stitch are you using in this design? Well, it's just a standard um, uh, uh, fill, nothing, no special uh, pattern to it. It was kind of the default setup in, in my um, embroidery software. The only thing I changed again in, in terms of the type of stitch was the stitch length of the, of the top stitch and also the underlay. Um, the underlay, by the way, I like at four millimeter stitch length, um, and the actual density of the underlay, the lattice look. If you were to look at the lattice, now this picture is kind of hard to see here, but basically what you end up with in the crosshatch or, or um, as we called it, the lattice look, is um, a, basically a, a grid of diamond shape. They're not diamond. Um, Yep, that's the right yeah. one, Rich. <laughs> diamond, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's a diamond shape, and it's if you look at it up close, the top and bottom of the triangle shape, and they're all uh, like all together, but the the diamond top and bottom are actually pointing at the at the opposite ends of the start and stop point of the fill stitch. So it's directly uh, perpendicular, if you will, to the fill stitch angle, and this is just the the best. I found the most perfect way to stabilize this material. A lot of people in, in designs I see um, only use a single pass underlay, and I, I don't think that really provides enough stabilization. In fact, I use not only for this type of material, I use this kind of underlay in a lot of different um, garments, not just this uh, performance wear. It's just a good all-around underlay technique. Somebody did ask uh, about what? the ang uh, the angles again. so. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, but it was at a 35 degree on one side and 135 degrees for the second um, part of the. This is the, that's in the under yeah. that's in the underlay. Yeah. That's in the underlay. But remember that is in relationship to the top stitch uh, fill direction uh -huh. and or angle. Excuse me, angle. And the angle of the top stitch, which is what we're looking for here, is 15 degrees. So not perfectly horizontal but definitely not at a sharp angle uh, to avoid that bias. So we wouldn't do it, for example, at a 45 degree angle. Right. So really I found that 15 degrees is just perfect. Um, and also the, the reason for that also is that the 15 degree works really well if you're doing lettering on top of it because then the lettering doesn't fall into the, um, to the stitches, whereas if you had a horizontal fill stitch direction and you put the lettering on top, uh, you, it wouldn't be as successful as this 15 degree angle is. Uh, the final thing I want to point out too is um, a lot of you have uh, software that does what we call curved fills or spiral type radiating fills. Avoid that at all cost when you're, do, when you're embroidering on this material. Uh, that is the ultimate way to stress this material and I guarantee you, you will have puckering if you do that. Now, would that include a satin outline stitch as well, Rich? Somebody had a question similar to that. No, satins are different. Yeah. Um, satin doesn't stress the material like the fills do. And again, mostly what I'm talking about, and you'll see some examples coming up, but uh, the main fill area in the design is what's going to cause the, the garment the most stress and the most problem. 
So that's the, the main area that you want to do this 15 degree angle. You'll of course want to do other stitch angles with maybe other elements in, the, in a design and you'll see an example of that coming up. And that's okay to do, but what we're, we're, we're trying to do is um, the main area of a design you want to try to stress the material the least and that's where the 15 degree um, stitch angle of a fill works the best. Rich, one of our, our visitors is curious what software you, you use. Um, I use Wilcom software, um, okay. but yeah, so most Pulse. all software out there, um, yep. uh, good quality software. I think Pulse is one that you folks use, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of good software out there and most of them have um, automatic underlay um, features and allow you to control stitch lengths and underlay densities and underlay stitch lengths and stitch angles and all that. So it's really not the software so much as just understanding your software and where to make the changes when you're digitizing. Okay, okay the next picture. Now and take a look at some other examples. Okay, these are examples of some designs that I've done on performance wear. Um, the uh, first thing I want to point out, I guess we'll start with the survivor design. Um, I don't know about a lot of you folks, but you know, we get a customer that uh, insists on what they want. I mean, they, they just say, hey, uh, you can say, you know, we really shouldn't do this kind of design on a performance wear, which, like I said earlier, we should avoid high stitch count designs, but our customers want what they want, right? I mean, they don't care whether you, what you say sometimes, they, they insist, you know, this is what I want. So that makes it more challenging for us, and that's why, um, like in that bottom right corner, uh, to start with, I had to simplify this design a lot there was just way, way too much going on. And those of you that are experienced digitizers understand this, that thread is not ink. You know, I, I don't know if there's an embroidery machine yet that, that ink comes out of, and that's what I explain to people, that, you know, we're really dealing with thread, and, and therefore um, we have to sometimes simplify a design in order to achieve uh, even any remote amount of success. So what I did was I took a lot of the elements out of this design, and maybe instead of 14 little squirrely gigs or something around the outside, I, I put four, and, and yet it still maintained the look of the design, but it simplified it enough that we could be successful with embroidery. But what the, the key that I did with this thing for um, performance wear is, first of all, it's coming up with the right kind of backing, which we're going to talk about down the road here, and also the hooping of it. But I did a lot of testing of the design itself and I made some changes to it. I was constantly lightening my densities and seeing how light I could go and still make it work. And I just finally found the, the happy spot in all of the elements in this, in this design um, that, it, that used the least amount of density but still maintained a good quality look. Um, this design sewed really flat, looked really good. Um, the customer is very happy and I guess they ordered three or four times uh, additional orders because they kept selling them so quickly. Um, the upper right design, Ethos, is one I did here just recently. Um, anyway, the, the main fill area again in this design is the one that we want to pay attention to and that's that dark green uh, fill behind the badge there. Um, that I did, again I did at a 15 degree stitch angle and then the cross hatch or lattice underlay um, and by the way, I think I, I forgot to mention, but the density of the underlay you can play with, but I usually start at about a three millimeter um, box, if you will, or, or the diamond shape. If you were to measure it from side to side, it would measure three millimeters. So when you see it so, it looks like a really, really light type of fill almost in the shape of these diamonds, but that's, that's the start with. And then um, what you do is you play with the density, so you, you determine what works best on whatever, whatever um, color you're working with. And that's the other thing to think about, too, is um, when you're dealing with a dark color garment and a light color thread or the opposite, that's going to play a factor in, in your densities on, on obviously on obtaining good coverage. But in this particular design, so that, that area there, the green area, is what I, I, I mentioned. I did the 15 degree angle and I did the cross hatch and, and stitch length on the fill is at four millimeters. Uh, I think a lot of software comes at default at three millimeter or three and a half millimeter. And that doesn't sound like a lot of difference, but it really is a, a big difference, I think. First of all, a longer stitch length is going to stress the material least 
it's also going to actually cover better than a shorter stitch length in your fills. Um, but the other aspect I wanted to point out in this one particular design is that if you look at that green and you say, okay, well, if I were going to digitize this, I do the pot bottom section of that shield green first. And actually, then I go up and I finish all the green area there, and I do the green first because that's the furthest behind, uh, the furthest back object in this design, and that's how you digitize. You usually work from the back forward. But uh, what I did was I didn't do that. I actually um, did the bottom section of that green fill, and then I did a color change, and I did the gray fill area behind the lettering consulting team. And then I, after I finished that, then I went, did a color change back to the green again and finished the top big fill area of the green. And again, the reason why I did that is I didn't want to trap that material. And I felt like I might have that um, risk uh, if I did the green all first and then came back and did the gray. But the other thing about the gray is now the main area behind the consulting team lettering is done at, 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 a, at a more or less horizontal stitch, but uh, stitch direction. But slightly opposite of that main green fill area there. So again, uh, you get a definition between the colors. And of course, the black outline ended up um, uh, finishing it off and, and hiding any um, gap between the two. But on the sides of the banner, you'll notice that it almost looks like it's a different color. Um, it's, but it actually is all the same gray. It's just that I changed the stitch direction on the outer portions of that banner. And again, um, what I'm talking about in the main fill stitch direction, that's what you've got to worry about. But of course, when you're doing elements of a design, you're going to change stitch direction on some of the smaller elements because that's what makes them interesting, and that's what makes the design work. And the only thing that I was careful about on that gray area is I made sure I did not trap the material as it sewed. And that gray area sews all one. And there's techniques that I use like travel stitches from one element to the next that all get hidden later um, in order to prevent having to do it a, a trim. But I got to tell you what, trims are not necessarily a bad thing. So if you feel like you need to throw another trim in there uh, to, to, so that you allows you to get from one part of the shirt to the other so that you can sew in a way that does not trap the material, then I would by all means, it's well worth it to do throw that extra trim in there even though our tendency is we want to eliminate as many trims as possible to maintain production uh, ability and speed. But in, in the final thing I want to point out about that is that this design is again, uh, I, I like to do everything from the center out uh, and bottom up if I can. So even the lettering, um, and it's just kind of a habit that I've gotten into where uh, the word ethos, for example, uh, I created all those letters from the center out. So I started with the H and I went to the T and then the E and then I I uh, trimmed and went over and did the O and then the S. So the whole idea is that as a design sews, it flattens out the material and it doesn't trap anything. Um, the design on the left uh, with the dragon there, uh, again, the main fill area, that being white, same kind of thing, horizontal, uh, basically 15 degree off of horizontal uh, stitch direction. The crosshatch underlay, as I mentioned before. And then the next color is the red. And again, that's if you're going from the furthest back, working your way forward, that's the next element. And that actually sews all without any trims. Uh, it sews first the upper right, started with the star, did that part of the border, and then it travels down and sews the next star at the bottom and that portion of the border. And then finally went up and finished the top star and that border. And then the final thing that sews is the gray dragon. And the gray dragon, there's some elements that are just too far apart from each other to uh, not have a trim. But even at that, um, I sewed the centermost portions of the dragon first and, and then finished it off. I think the head is the last thing that sews. And again, everything is designed to flatten out the material evenly as it sews. Rich, can and I the, stop and interrupt you just for a minute? A couple of people sure. have written in asking for a, a longer description of what trapping the material means. Can you explain oh, that? Okay. Absolutely. Um, you remember the two circles, right? And uh, w when we first saw that uh, one that was puckering, um, how it sewed, it basically trapped or bubbled the material. And, and if, you, if you look at it, um, 
it would sew from the right to the left and then the other circle from the left to the right. Well, guess what happens when they meet in the middle? You're trapping the material. You're making it bubble up and, and it has nowhere to go. And so what's it going to do? It's going to be a, like a, the potato chip look. It's going to be a big wave in that. And there's no way to get rid of it because uh, the very nature of embroidery is, um, it, especially in fills, it pushes. In other words, every single layer of stitching back and forth and back and forth in a fill, when it finally gets to wherever it's finishing, um, it's actually going to grow or push the material uh, out a little bit. And it really doesn't seem like it would happen, but it makes sense that it does, and especially with this material, it's really stretchy. So the, the bubbling that I'm talking about or trapping is, is basically the material having nowhere to go and and actually um, forming a bubble, if you will, uh, from from the fact that it started and stopped in those particular sequences uh, in the wrong place. And that's why I always like to try to go pay attention to how I'm doing a design. So as I'm digitizing, I try to visualize how it's going to sew on the machine. Um, I think one of the best ways to um, learn digitizing or even good embroidery just overall is to watch a design that was well digitized sew and just watch how it sews and you can kind of see for yourself and imagine what's going to happen to that material as the, as the design is being created and that, that's what I do when I digitize I try to visualize okay if I start here and I end over here what's it going to do you know what's the material going to do are we going to cause any problems and so you try to think ahead about what you're doing and where you're going to start a certain element, where you're going to end it. And then how does that relate to all the other elements in the design? How do they start and stop? Are we going to have a problem if we start at this one spot and end over here? And are we going to trap the material? Is it going to have nowhere to go but bubble up? Uh, I hope that kind of explains it better for everybody. Um, if not, I can we can talk about some more. Rich, it actually does explain it. Um, I think that you did a really great job explaining it, and it also addressed a question that somebody wrote in um, just a few minutes ago. Um, and I think sometimes that bubbling or that curving, like a potato chip, doesn't happen or doesn't show up until you've actually laundered the product itself. Um, so that was a good um, question that somebody sent in, and they're um, they're actually asking how they can avoid that. And I think that your description of you know going from the center out and the bottom up so as not to trap that fabric. Um, that's how you're going to fix that um, or avoid that, that from and, happening. That's true. And that's, this is the digitizing aspect now. There are other things that we're going to discuss here soon that also will help you prevent that, that um, puckering after, a lawn, after being laundered. Um, uh, the final of the design, let me finish up here with the one on the bottom left there. Um, there is that green area there, the main part of the hand. Um, the reason I'm pointing this out is it used a cross-hatch underlay in the same, again, 15 degree to horizontal stitch direction. But what I did there was I increased the stitch length all the way up to 5 millimeters, which is um, quite long, really, for a, a normal fill. Most fills, like I said, the default in our softwares are like 3 millimeter or 3.5 millimeter. And what I typically like is a default of about four, but in this particular case, because um, I'm not having any lettering that goes on top, uh, the hand was just the hand, um, I was able to, to increase that to five millimeters. What that did was, first of all, I think it looks prettier. It's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but longer stitch lengths always look prettier. That's why satin stitches are the prettiest stitch in embroidery, because they're nice and long and they don't have um, as many needle penetrations, whereas in a fill stitch, it's basically just a row after row after row of, uh, of running stitches, and they tend to look kind of flat. And so the way you get that to look better is to increase the stitch length, because then it's, you get a little bit more shine from the uh, thread, and therefore it looks prettier. But the other aspect, of course, is that you get better coverage with it. And I had kind of a challenge with this particular design, because it was going to be this dark green thread on a white polo. Boy, that's tough um, to get the kind of coverage you want without putting way too many stitches in the design and then therefore stressing the material and causing puckering afterwards. 
when this thing was all said and done, it laid perfectly flat, um, right out of the hoop. Um, it just looked terrific. The final thing that I do, and we'll point this out really, and, and, and it's, it's a tip that I like to give people, and a lot of you already do this, but when you're finally all said and done and you're through with your embroidery on this, on this performance wear, don't be afraid to hit it with, a, with a, an iron and a little bit of steam. Um, I like to do that just because I like to present my product, my shirts, to my customers so that it, it, it looks its best. And sometimes if you have any hoop marks or anything like that, of course, that relieves that. But the key that it does for this performance wear is it relaxes the stitches. It, it finally sets them so that they lay perfectly flat. So good digitizing, and then we're going to talk about hooping here pretty quick. And then finally pressing it with an iron is, is the key to finally get a good uh, flat look in, in your finished product. Rich, just one quick question before we leave this slide. What was the stitch count for Survivor? <laughs> that one was a lot. I think it was about 22,000 stitches. I mean, it was crazy. Okay. Uh, just way, way too much. The design itself is a pretty good sized design, and, and that, the way I size that design, by the way, is how most people should, I think, uh, size a design, and that is based on the smallest, most important element. In this case, it was the lettering second chance, I think was the smallest uh, lettering, that, and that was like four and a half millimeters tall, and so the overall design ended up being about, I think it was close to four inches wide, which is, I think, about the, the largest you want to go with the left chest design. We also have a, a tool, if everybody can hang in with us till the end of the, of the webinar, that, um, that's useful for attaching very high stitch count uh, badges like that one. Rich, what was the size of that logo? A lot of interest in the Survivor, in the survivor logo. 22,000 stitches, and, and what's the size of it? I think it was about four inches wide, if my memory serves me right. So it was four inches wide and about uh, maybe two and a quarter uh, inches tall. I think okay. that's what it turned out to be. And then, by the way, um, kind of off subject here, but I use 60 weight thread in some of that detail, like the small lettering second chance. And if those of you have not turned on to that, you probably know I'm a nut about that stuff. It works really well. Thank and you. So I would encourage you to try it. Okay. We're going to go over to Nancy now, and she's going to talk a little bit about choosing the correct backing for performance wear. Okay, so uh, we started off a theme here uh, with Think Light. It's really important to keep that in mind when you're talking about embroidering on performance wear, so that does include the backing as well. And for backings, um, when you're embroidering on these types of fabrics, you'll want to maybe move away from those basic cutaway backings, um, and especially the, not the tearaway backing on its own, but there's a couple of low profile backings that are available that work really great with this, lin, uh, this thin fabric um, and it works um, very well with it. Um, one is a no-show web lawn, that's a dialog mesh, has a little bit of a um, uh, embossed look to it. You might be familiar with that one. A fairly new one to the industry is a woven cutaway backing uh, for performance wear as well. Um, and the key here is that these are both lightweight, they're low profile. Um, backings, so you're not adding a lot of bulk behind that thin fabric. Additionally, you can use, with one of one or the other of these backings, you can use a lightweight, highest, um, a medium weight tearaway to add a little more stability. It can increase the crispness to the design, um, especially, um, you can, it helps the whole design, but especially within the small letters themselves. Um, so, gonna, um, on the next slide here, we have a couple of just images of the backings to familiarize yourself with them. On the upper right-hand corner is that Easy Cut Performance Wear backing. You can see that's a woven fabric, which is really unusual for backings. Uh, most backings are not woven. This is one that was um, manufactured specifically for this reason. And on the lower left-hand side are the Weblon uh, no-show backings, again, both low-profile, um, great products for the, uh, along with the digitizing that Rich talked about. Um, Nancy? Yes. Uh, I was going to ask you, too, um, I have found that the Weblon is what I've been using for many years and really love it. And as you said, it's, it's nice and lightweight. Um, I've, uh, on really heavy stitch count designs, in particular that uh, Survivor, design everybody was asking about with that high stitch count. 
I use two layers of that Weblon uh, for that. Um, but uh, recently, uh, with this performance where uh, backing that upper right corner picture there, um, I found that I can use just a single layer of that for the same high stitch count design and have pretty good success. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. And you know, and for a really big design, um, not really big, you could use two pieces of either one of these. Um, and like Rich said, I think the web lawn, you could easily use two pieces. Um, but because they are the low profile, if you need a little more stability, um, just when it comes to that cut performance in the upper right hand corner, you might be adding a little bit too much thickness if you go in um, two pieces. Um, so two backings there, like Rich said. Uh, when it comes to the angle of the woven cutaway backing, Rich, would you recommend hooping it at an angle, or does, do you think that would matter? No, I haven't necessarily felt that. I, the, what I like to buy are the pre-cuts, um, because um, I guess I'm too lazy to cut my own out of a big roll, but I just find that it's much faster for me in production to have them pre-cut, and I, I just go by what um, how they're cut and place them in my hooping device that way. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had any, I don't do anything special with that, no. Okay, I agree. I think pre-cuts are the way to go very easily. Easily, um, You just grab it and it saves a lot of time. Uh, one question that somebody asked was, does the cutaway fray? Um, it's actually pretty, um, it, it seems to have something on it that keeps it from fraying like badly. You know, it, it doesn't fray unless you really pull on it. Um, and we've actually done some testing here as well, embroidered and washed um, several times. And yes, it's going to get a little bit softer on the back side and you will have a little bit of string. Um, so the other question was how close do you trim it? Um, when it comes to backings, I tend to trim, you know, about a quarter of an inch from the design. There are some tricks, tips and tricks when you're trimming backing away from back, um, from an embroidered garment, you always want to make sure that you're holding the backing while you trim, and you want to be able to see the garment or the fabric as you trim. That will help you avoid um, nipping or nicking the fabric itself and making a hole in it and essentially ruining your whole, whole job once you put a hole in the fabric. So I usually go about a quarter of an inch from the edge. Uh, difference between... Because, I was going to say, because it's so sheer, you really don't have to get so close to the embroidery itself. That quarter inch works just fine. Yep, absolutely. Somebody asked about the difference between Weblon and the Woven. Um, kind of what it sounds like that their names kind of um, indicate that cut performance woven backing is a woven backing. So you have threads that are um, overlaid like a basket and it um, and that's the way that fabric is made. The other one that is nylon, um, sometimes referred to poly mesh um, within the industry. There's another backing out there that really truly is a polyester mesh. Um, this one is actually nylon, and it's a wo uh, we call it Weblon no-show. It's not woven. It has a little bit of um, an embossment looking, look to it, a little bit lighter weight than the performance wear. Somebody did ask, how do you use the tearaway backing with it? Well, you always want to lay the tearaway backing down first, and you can put either the Weblon or the performance cutaway backing next, and then your garment, and then you're going to hoop it. What that does is it gives you a little bit of extra stability during the embroidery, and when all is said and done, you can simply tear away the lightweight tearaway backing, and then you can trim with your scissors uh, the cutaway backing. But you do want to have that cutaway as far away from the... Um, the garment, so you're allowed to um, tear it away easily. And the woven performance backing is not stretchy uh, because it is woven, unless you were to pull it on its bias, like we talked about earlier. So if you pull it on the angles, you're going to get a little bit of stretch. When you pull it side to side, top to bottom, you're not going to have any stretch to it. So it's a real um, similar to a um, typical cutaway backing. Okay, let's take a look at examples of some where your backing actually can affect how the outcome um, of the same design here. This design here is about an inch and a quarter wide by an inch and a half tall. 
same exact design, same exact threads were used. The only thing that was changed were the backings themselves. On the left-hand side, you can see that those designs do not look as well. Um, on the upper left-hand side, I used a basic 3-ounce cutaway backing because I wanted to make sure that design looked well. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking as an embroiderer out there that might choose that cutaway back because it does make the design look well. And you have to admit that design there looks really well. Unfortunately, that halo that you're seeing behind it is the three ounce cutaway backing on the back side. So that's a solid white backing behind a lightweight uh, white fabric. So that's what we call in the industry the badge effect. So it looks like there's a white badge that's behind there. And if anybody has seen that worn on um, a person walking around, it's really not that good looking. It looks, the design looks nice, but the backing doesn't. On the bottom hand, uh, bottom left side, I got a little lazy and I used a tearaway backing because you know, this is a nice square design, a little uh, rectangle design, and if I use a tear away, I can simply tear it away. It makes it nice and easy in the end, um, but unfortunately, it did not support the fabric while it was being embroidered enough because it is just a tear away, and the puckering occurred. Um, and not only did, do you have puckering there, you're seeing some distortion in the design as well. And on the right-hand side are both the Weblon no-show on the top right and the performance on the bottom right. And those are those low profile. I did trim them about a quarter of an inch um, from the edge. And both designs look great. Um, little to no distortion and a little to no puckering there on that. And that's what you're, you want to achieve with this. This design was digitized, much similar in, um, in the way that Rich uh, recommended as well. So that along with the proper backing and the proper hooping, which is coming up next, um, produced beautiful designs that are going to last throughout um, multiple washes. Nancy, quick question, please. Can you repeat the order of using tearaway in the mesh? Sure. Um, the tearaway, you want that as far away from your fabric or your garment as possible. So think of it as lay down that tearaway, lay down your your performance wear backing, and then put your garment on top. Now you're ready to hoop it all so that the tearaway is on the very bottom and you sandwich the um, cut performance in the middle. The idea is there, once you hoop it, you have a nice sturdy hooping. Um, so it's holding that fabric nice and well, giving a little more stability during the embroidery process. When you're done, you can easily tear the um, tearaway backing away because it's not sandwiched, it's on the, the bottom side. Um, so that's the idea. You want to be able to tear it away easily, and then you want to trim your cutaway back with the scissors. And somebody mentioned, um, what about after laundering, they were experiencing some puckering. Well, a good quality um, cutaway backing um, will prevent that after washing. That's one of its functions. Yep, and actually somebody actually um, just asked about using a wash away with the tear uh, with a web lawn or tear away. A wash away is just what it sounds like. It's going to wash away eventually. Um, so it's really going to give your design and fabric no support once it's been washed once or twice. Um, it, it essentially disappears. So you need that cutaway backing, um, the web lawn no show, or the cut performance wear is what you want to have on the back side of these types of garments with the right designs, correct hooping, and you're going to find you don't get the puckering and you don't, you're not going to get that potato chip curling. And also, um, that's why uh, color of the backing is, is a good idea to pay attention to. Like, for example, you wouldn't use a black tear, uh, cutaway backing on a white shirt for obvious reason, and so you'd want to use a white one. Um, I, I noticed in the web line that you guys have that in black, white, and then in a tan. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh -huh. Yep. Nancy and Rich, um, I know you both had discussions about the use of adhesive spray. Um, does anybody want to, the question came in about that. Do you ever use adhesive spray with the web lawn? One of you want to? You know, I, I personally avoid that, um, only that it's one extra step. And if you're in a high production shop, um, it's just it's it's just one more thing to to deal with. But the the other aspect to it, it's messy. Uh, it also tends to gum up your needles, even if you use 
so-called needle-friendly spray adhesive. Um, so I, I like to try to avoid it. Also, just that spray adhesive in the air is not good to breathe. It's not good in the electronics in your machines. Uh, so I tend to avoid it. However, um, I have to say that if you've got a particularly challenging uh, garment or something, um, I certainly, you know, you never say never. Um, so uh, I would, you know, give, give it an experiment and try it and see if that helps you. Um, as a general rule, I think if you use the correct backing um, and you hoop it correctly and you have a well digitized, digitized design, you shouldn't need to use spray adhesive. But what's your experience, Nancy? I agree as well, and I got to be honest. When I first started hooping, hooping is probably one of the most challenging things overall when it comes to embroidering. And I did use it at the beginning, and I found it helped to learn how to hoop properly um, to get a good um, kind of tension within the hoop itself. I think when it comes to this fabric, um, Rich is going to talk about hooping techniques that I think are going to help you out as well, um, so you might be able to avoid using that extra step. Um, it has its places, has its needs, um, certainly for sure, um, but we're talking about four elements here during this webinar, and hooping is, is a big element, um, or just as big as all the other, other elements that you'll see, so um, why don't we take a look at that, and maybe that's going to help you. Okay, the other component to uh, embroidering successfully on performance wear is, is how you hoop it. And what I'm going to talk about here is, are traditional hoops. I know uh, some of you out there have a, the uh, what's called the magnetic hooping systems, and, and I will tell you up front that I really don't have much experience with it. I've heard a lot of great positive things about it. Uh, in particular, it seems to work, and what it was designed for was to work particularly well with really hard to hoop items like Carhartt jackets and heavy bags and things like that where um, it takes three men and a gorilla to get some of these items to hoop. And um, you know, I'm a pretty strong guy and I can kind of overcome most items, but you know, a, lot of, a lot of people out there, it's, it's just really difficult to do. So the magnetic hoops really help, help in that. Um, I have to say that the key though with performance wear, and like I said, I don't have any experience with the magnetic hoops to tell you this. Uh, whether you experience this or not, but what you want to absolutely avoid when you're hooping performance wear is, is getting the, the material to stretch. Um, if you stretch that material as you hoop it and you make it nice and tight in the hoop, um, guess what's going to happen after you embroider it? You're going to pop that hoop loose and that stretched material is going to try to go back to its original shape and compounding that, you've added a whole bunch of stitches and then what's going to happen is everything's going to uh, just pucker right up. So by all means, you have to avoid that um, uh, hooping it too tight. And so I, I, I'm, what I'm saying about magnetic hoops is uh, experiment it, with it and try it. And if you notice that you're getting a lot of some puckering, uh, you may want to experiment using the old traditional hoops. Now how do you hoop with a traditional hoop? Um, that's uh, typically the, the round green hoops that I have for my machines, my Tejimas. Um, what I like to do is I take the garment and the two um, pieces of the hoop and I put them together without any backing and I flip it over so that I can adjust the um, inner hoop ring and I tighten that thumb screw or loosen it, however which, until just the material is, is secure, not gripped tightly at all, but is just basically just barely ho holding it. Um, and then I try going ahead and putting my combination of whatever the um, backing I'm going to use, whether it's a performance wear with a, a tearaway or weblon or however many layers of that. But anyway, I put all that together and then the final test then is as you hoop it, you want to make sure that that hoop is just barely uh, holding the material. Now obviously you don't want it to fall out of the uh, fall off of the, of the material as it's embroidering, well that would be disastrous, but you don't want it to be strangling that material and, and more importantly stretching it. So once you get that um, adjusted, and sometimes it takes a little playing with it to get it adjusted right so that you're happy with it. But then once you get that adjusted, then I take all my hoops, hoop rings out for the production job that I'm doing, and I make them all adjusted the same, and then I don't have to think about it from then on. And then when you go ahead and do the hooping, then again, like I said, you lay the material in there and you lay the hoop in, and you should just gently have to push on that hoop to get it to hoop over the material. And you should not see that 
um, that performance where stretching or very m modestly stretching it, if at all. And that's the, that's the goal. And then, like I said, if you're not happy with it, if it looks like it's stretching at all, then just keep adjusting it until, um, until you don't get that. Um, and then it's just a technique issue. You know, once you get used to um, you know, hooping this stuff, then, then you don't even think about it. You just do it and, and it becomes fast and easy. But the crucial thing, like I said, is uh, not, uh, not over-tightening it. Rich, a question came in um, specifically on, on what you're talking about. Someone um, talking about how they, they hoop the way you're describing and the inner hoop falls out, even if it is pretty tight. Um, this person has to either tape or clamp, which is time consuming. Um, can you, do you have any suggestions on how they can avoid uh, the hoop falling out? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. I, I think that um, one of the factors that keeps the hoop uh, secure, the two pieces secure to each other, um, is first of all, you're gonna have um, some friction or resistance from the type of backing you're using and then also you've got the garment itself. Um, I have never seen one actually fall out like that. If it really is falling out then you probably need to tighten it a little bit. Um, you can experiment with it and I have done this with not with performance wear necessarily but with other types of garments. If you were worried about it after you've hooked it um, and you're concerned about it being gee, it looks like it's just right and it's not stretched and everything's good, but I'm, gosh, I'm just a little bit worried about it um, popping loose, then, um, you know, you can flip the garment over after it's hooped and you can tighten that um, uh, thumb screw up just a little bit uh, while it's already hooped. You're not stretching the material, not stretching it, you're not changing anything other than you're just clamping that hoop a little bit better and that should make you feel better and so therefore you won't have any problems. I've never had a um, garment fall out of its hoop while it was embroidering. Um, that would obviously be dis disastrous. I think with heavy items like Carhartts and all that, you know, it's, it, it, the tendency is for that to happen and that's because the garment overall is so darn heavy that um, as it's embroidering around the machine, if it's not hooped really tight, you know, just the weight of the garment will pull itself out of the hoop while it's in the machine. But I've never had that experience with performance wear because it's so darn light uh, already. It really doesn't take much to hold it. Okay, thank you. If we can take a look at, at this slide now, if you can um, share with us the, the correct way for hooping. Sure, and you know, obviously here we've got two different size hoops, a 15 centimeter and a 12 centimeter. Um, the smaller the hoop, the better, obviously, that you want um, for a tiny design like this, a uh, world championship design, uh, this 12 centimeter hoop uh, worked the best. Um, the other one would work okay, but um, it's really best to use the smallest hoop as you can. Um, so that's, that's the rule of thumb there. The bottom left corner actually just shows you how, in fact, I think it looks like they're pulling on the bias that we were talking about earlier of this material at, at a diagonal. You can see how stretchy it is. Um, one of the things you can do, just like I said, just to kind of picture in your mind uh, what the material's like is to go ahead and grab it before you do anything with it and just pull on it and see which, which way it stretches the most. And I think you'll see the, this bias that we're talking about where you pull it in a diagonal or 45 degree um, directions, that it, that's where it stretches the most. Um. Okay. Anyway, here are some examples of what not to do and, and what to do, I guess, to achieve success. The ones on the left there, I deliberately overstretched the material when I, when I um, uh, hooped them. Uh, the other thing I did was um, I increased the stitch densities on the fill areas behind Superstore, that white fill area there, and the, the white fill area behind the little checkered flag. And then also in the Chrysler logo down below and the Ford logo, I increased those stitch uh, densities quite a bit. And all that again just kind of overstresses the combination of the hooping it too tight and too many stitches um, just overstress the material and so when you when I got through embroidering it you get this really kind of puckery wavy look and even a, a clothes iron you won't be able to fix that. Um, whereas the ones on the right I used the right um, densities and I hooped them just tight enough and they came out nice and flat and looked good. But one of the things about performance wear I wanted to point out too in digitizing is that you have to watch in lettering um, 
it tends to have a, need a lot more distortion. And you, you think that's kind of a funny term, but SM, uh, digitizers use that because what we're doing is we're exaggerating sometimes, particularly in lettering, um, each letter because we know that as they sew, they're going to want to change and, and look different in the finished um, product. So, for example, in the word Toyota, um, the columns of the T and the A and the Y are going to grow. That's the push aspect. Um, the pull aspect is, are, is evident in the O's of Toyota. So what does that mean? Well, that means when I digitize it, if you saw my design on screen, you'd see it look really goofy because the T, I sh had the bottom part of that T, I, I, I left it way up high because I knew it was going to grow. And then the O, I made it quite a bit bigger, bigger around than, than it really looked right on screen. It looked terrible on screen. But when it embroiders, then it shrinks all up, and then the T grows a little bit. And so when everything is said and done, everything lines up and looks, looks proportionate, looks correct. And what you're going to find with performance wear is you need to do that kind of distortion more so than any other kind of material. Rich, um, one question came in about the underlay. Under, uh, what's the best underlay to use under satin stitches? Since we have a lot of letters here, maybe that would be helpful. Yes, it is. And I'll tell you what, I use a basic rule of thumb is how wide are the columns in the letters. Um, uh, anything that is, I think, over um, two millimeters wide, um, I like an edge walk. Um, I don't know, some people call it guideline. It's Again, each software describes it differently, but basically that's a running stitch that goes just on the inside um, perimeter, if you will, of the columns. Um, and what that does is it gives those satin stitches to grab something to grab a hold of so you minimize the amount of pull that occurs when it's stitching those letters. And the key also, and I see this time and time again, is you have to make sure that the stitch length in that guideline or edge walk underlay is, is not too long. Uh, I see stitch lengths of two and a quarter um, uh, millimeters long or three millimeters long, way too long for that. You want them shorter. I, I usually set my default between one and a half to 1.8 millimeters in length. And then the distance from the edge, um, that's where you have to play with it a little bit. Um, I like about 0.45 millimeters from the edge. And then with performance wear, I'll even throw some pull comp or, or width to those columns even more because, again, they shrink up more with this material than usual. But then as a final thing, uh, oftentimes, depending upon what, what the coverage aspect is, in other words, like the, in lithia, for example, um, it's kind of hard to tell from these pictures, but those are pretty actually pretty wide columns. And I have white thread going on a black garment. And so I added a, a double zigzag or just a single zigzag on top of the edge walk. And that aids in the, in the coverage aspect so I don't have any black garment showing through. And again, the whole idea is I don't want to, the first thing I want to do is do the underlay. And, and then, then the last thing, if I'm still not getting cover, enough coverage, is I might tweak the upper thread density or the actual um, satin stitch density, if you will. Thank you. Uh, for, okay, sorry, uh, yeah, for, I think we're, we're really close on running front. Running out of time. Yeah, I'm we sorry. are. No, that's okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to move into needle and thread real quickly now. Um, so a lot of people are asking about this at the beginning of the webinar, so here we have the needle and thread. Um, when it comes to the best thread overall, rayon um, thread is a, has a more of a soft hand or soft feel to it, so it lays a little better, it curves a little better than a polyester thread, so whenever possible, um, sticking with rayon is a good choice for the performance wear fabric itself. Um, polyester can be used as well, um, so if something you, you can potential to be laundered with bleach, you would want to use the polyester. Uh, 7010 needle for the 40 weight is a great size needle to use for it. Um, so typically a 7511 is the standard size needle for 40 weight thread. Consider going a little lighter or smaller with that needle uh, when you're just sticking with the 40 weight thread. Ballpoint needles um, are the best because they're not going to cause any runs. So a true sharp needle is could it potentially slice the um, the threads within that knit fabric and cause a run much similar to what you might see in a, in a nylons. 
Um, and then consider specialty threads like the FS Metallic 50, if you're going to add a little bit of bling. Somebody did ask, um, would you use a coverall for the back side of performance wear? Um, might not be necessary on our, a general rule, but if you're using metallic thread especially, um, you might want to consider putting that finisher on the back side of the garment to um, prevent any itchiness. Um, so from here, we'll take a look at um, the threads themselves. Um, you get your rayon that's available in a 40 and 60 weight. Do consider using your 60 weight for your smaller letters and your fine detailing within um, the designs themselves. The 60 weight is also available in the poly neon, and additionally, a 75 weight is available there. So um, threads get thinner and thinner. Uh, you can get more details out of the um, out of your designs when you throw in those lighter weight, especially with this thin fabric as well. Now we got the fish up there on a blue performance wear um, that Rich digitized for us some time ago, um, and that has some FS50 metallic in there. It gives it a little bit of bling. Right here we have a nice needle chart for you. This is actually um, available as one of the handouts, and um, the needles themselves, so when it comes to uh, 68 needle, those are great for your thinner weight threads, um, your classic rayon, your poly neon 60 weights, and the 75, uh, 75 weight, a small um, 68 needle works great. Um, for your 40 weights, you can use your 7010, but you can also use a 65-9 needle. If everything's set up well, digitizing, your machine tensions are great. The smaller the needle, the smaller the penetration. Um, hole and the crisper in the design. So that's a great example there. Um, we point out there that ballpoint needles are usually um, labeled with the SES, especially um, on these smaller size needles, and that's going to indicate that it is a ballpoint needle. And the reason why they're best for performance wear is they're going to push the fabric aside as it penetrates rather than um, slice the fabric as it's going through. There are universal point needles out there as well, usually indicated with the RG on the packaging, and that is another option. You just want to make sure you are staying away from the true sharp point needles um, when you're embroidering on any knit fabric. So Alice had mentioned this earlier with that Survivor um, logo as another alternative when it comes to performance wear. Like Rich said, you know, your customers want what your customers want. So when they come in with a 30,000 stitch design that's four inches by three inches and say, please, you know, put this on lightweight performance wear fabrics, um, it's really not, it's, it's a true challenge. Um, and if anybody can do it, Rich can. Um, but another option out there is using the multifunctional frame system because this, with this, uh, with this product, you can actually minimize the stitches that actually go on to the performance wear. You can also pr um, produce standalone uh, badges, um, and it is specific to your machine, and it, the hoop itself can just be used for, for other uh, hooping jobs as well. I'll take a look at a couple of examples. Um, here that we're actually done with it. So the product itself comes with a, a square gray hoop, the two metal inlays on the upper left-hand side, and those paper pre-frames there. On the lower right-hand side, we're showing you how a standalone lace, um, oh, sorry, I keep wanting to say that, um, it's a standalone badge, um, so essentially it pops right out of that plastic. Um, so that's one of its intentions. The other one is you can take it and embroider that scuba diver that's on the upper right-hand side um, all of the blue, the scuba diver, the green grass that's growing up there, which is probably 20,000 stitches there all in and of itself, was digitized specifically to stitch out on this plastic. Once that part was done, the machine was stopped and it was hooped. The garment itself was hooped in. And that badge itself was attached with the green and the yellow satin stitches and the lettering um, and the little stars there were put on the fabric itself um, with probably about another 10,000 stitches. So we took a design that was 30,000 stitches and took off 20,000 from the garment itself. So putting a big design is, avail or is an option and this um, nifty tool here helps you achieve that. Um, not only does it help you do that on the back side, you notice I use the black weblon on the black fabric. 
and it actually gave it a real nice look to the back side of it, a real finished look. So all of the stitching and the plastic part is underneath there or on top of the garment itself. Okay, a real quick summary. Uh, Rich and Nancy, if you can give us one brief statement about each one of the topics that you've each talked about. Sure. Now, in digitizing, that's the first element. Uh, lighter densities, longer stitch lengths, using proper underlay, um, and don't be afraid to do some testing to achieve what, what works best, and then just hooping it as lightly as possible without stretching it. When it comes to the backing, think light, um, lightweight backings with low profile um, is the way to go for performance wear. Rich hooping? Yes, I mentioned hooping it as lightly as possible. Um, you don't want to stretch the material. Uh, you want it to lay just um, smooth and flat, and you don't want it to stress it at all because uh, that that's will cause uh, puckering once you release it from the hoop. And when it comes to the thread itself, <coughs> excuse me, the thread itself, do think light. Um, consider those lighter weight 68 threads as an option. Excuse me. <coughs> When it comes to the needle, um, consider going down a size. So go a little bit smaller with that needle um, when you're, you're embroidering on this fabric. Okay, um, we've gone a little bit over time, which we, if you're still with us, we appreciate your time. Uh, we had a lot of information to cover, and I think many of you appreciated the, the wealth of knowledge that Rich and, and Nancy have shared with you. Um, here you have a reward. We want to thank you for sticking um, through this hour plus with us, 10% uh, off your next order. We have contact information here for Rich. Um, we've actually sent all of you an email already. If you check your emails after you've um, kind of logged off our, our webinar, we've sent you an email with links. Um, the only thing that we don't have for you yet is the full question and answer uh, between Nancy and Rich. Um, and Morgan on the computer. We will be collecting, as I mentioned at the very beginning, all of your questions and sending them all out to you. Um, the, the webinar, sorry, the email that is waiting for you now will have links to our printed version of the webinar if you'd like to print out the screens. Uh, we will be getting up on YouTube the actual recording. Um, we do have a link to Rich's website if you'd like to see more of what he's done and a lot of info sheets, some of the charts that Nancy has described to you. A question very early on after the slide with the information about our blog. We do have a, a, a business blog that is intended to be educational. It is madeiramatters.net, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, madeiramatters.net. We'll put in a link to that as well. Thank you so much for your time. We hope that you've enjoyed the experience and we'll be um, back to you. Watch your emails. We'll have another webinar within two months. Thank you.